regardless of the language and regardless of the culture, saying today that you're an Arab Jew is saying the most subversive thing that you can say against, you know, a hundred years old Zionist activity and culture and propaganda in Palestine and then in Israel that very, very strongly tries to erase that past, okay? In addition to that, in a way, when you say Arab Jew, you want to challenge two forms of two big edifices of, of nationalism. Jewish nationalism, as it is interpreted by Zionism, but also Arab nationalism. We must never forget that it was a very, very convenient thing for Arab nationalisms, as well as for Jewish nationalisms in the Middle East, particularly after 48, but even before, and certainly after 57 and 67, 56 and 67, to exclude Jews from the Arab nations. Um, Jews who were secularized um, in the Middle East tended to be on the left as minorities, um, tended to actually participate in secular uh, nationalist discourses that emphasized Arabness as opposed to Muslimness. Okay? And this is very much like uh, Jews as minorities, as religious minorities joining communist parties or Marxist organizations in Europe and particularly in Eastern Europe. All communist, virtually all communist parties in the Middle East um, and leftist organizations had significant numbers of Jews um, and, of course, other minorities as well. Um, and also members of the majorities, but you can see very, very strong. I mean, we are talking about the cases of Iraq, the cases of uh, um, Egypt. These are very, very well known, but also in Palestine, as well as, for instance, in Morocco, Algeria, um, and Tunisia. Um, we're talking about very, very prominent uh, communists. Many of these people actually stayed in these countries after 48 and even after 40, 50, uh, 67. Um, since, you know, this, uh, m many of these countries uh, were modernizing uh, slowly, the majority still remained in the traditional um, institutions, you know, in traditional in the, kept the Ottoman legacy, basically kept Jewish identity as a religious identity within a much larger um, changing atmosphere and society and tried very hard to negotiate that. You know, we're talking about the chief rabbis of this, uh, this organization and so on. Others um, joined uh, simply nationalist organizations and tried to see themselves as Iraqis, as Moroccans, first and foremost as Egyptians, um, as Syrians, and only secondly or, you know, saying, well, you know, the fact that we're Jews doesn't really matter to these things, you know, that we participate in that. Interestingly enough, no Jewish nationalist and no Jewish communist in the Middle East actually identified as an Arab Jew. You know, there were Iraqi Jews, there were Egyptian Jews, there were Tunisian Jews, there were Moroccan Jews, and so on. I mean, but we have to remember that these nations, you know, didn't really, they called themselves the Arab world or the Arab countries, but they didn't really emphasize the Arabness as well, okay? I mean, it was much more, you know, the local identities or the local nationalism were much more important. Um, particularly in the beginning uh, of the century and the rise of Arab nationalism, you see a great deal of activities in print. In other words, Jewish journalists, Jewish authors, particular, part, 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 participating in something that we call today the Arab Nahda, i.e. The, um, the rise of you know, the educated liberal secular class in the, um, uh, in the Arab world, very much uh, present there. So in that regard, you see Zionism as a very, relatively very small. I mean, if you think about, you know, Iraq, okay, which is a very interesting case. Um, one, 1,500 Jews were members of the Iraqi, uh, Iraqi Zionist movement in, 19, uh, in 1941. And this is after the Farhud, the pogrom. Right after that, as memories of the Farhud uh, uh, faded, you see numbers of the Zion, members of the Zionist movement in Baghdad dwindling. The interesting part about this, it's not so interesting, it's kind of tragic, is the disappearance of this legacy. Um, not only from um, Middle Eastern memory, but also from Middle Eastern archives. And today, to a certain extent, it, ma it makes a comeback. I'd like to credit you know, a colleague, uh, an excellent colleague, who, who's, um, who's doing most of the research on that, you know, uh, Dr. Najat Abdel Haq. You know, from, from Palestine Nablus, who has been studying that. I heard her give a fabulous talk a year ago in this context of the Arab Jew. She identified no less than 13 novels centered on the question and the presence of Jews in the Arab world, 
coming from Yemen, coming from Libya, where you don't expect to see that that much, but, and of course also from Egypt, Iraq, Syria, elsewhere. I would add to that, um, uh, uh, series such as, you know, Bab al-Hara, which is centered on Jews, and other uh, Ramadan telenovelas that you can see right now in Egypt, for instance, in which Jews feature either as center uh, uh, characters in these, uh, uh, um, in these shows, or, you know, at least marginal, but the fact is that they are present. So this is, the, this, this is the evidence. My take on that, that this is, first of all, represents a certain nostalgia to a past where there was a greater degree of uh, religious tolerance. More importantly, I think it also represents a time where the Arab nation state was um, just in the making. It was m far more open than it is uh, today, far less repressive. Um, and in a way, since um, the Jews actually disappeared from the Arab world, you know, when you make them present again, you actually make it present to, the, uh, to, that, to that particular past. So in many ways, it's not exactly nostalgia to the Jews. Okay? These are imagined Jews, and sometimes when you, see, when you read these novels, you see that you know, the Im imagining the Jews is not exactly accurate. But you know, there is a desire to see them coming back. Um, in addition to that, particularly in cases such as Egypt, but also to a certain extent in Iraq itself and other, other places. Jews left, but they left a legacy. The plan to exchange, quote unquote, Jews for Palestinians was there on people's minds already before the creation of Israel. Okay? Um, there were books, uh, uh, people writing, people were interested in that. I mean, we need to remember it from a global approach. In the since the 20s and even before that, but certainly in the 30s and even in the 40s, particularly after the war, you have major cases of displacements. So in many ways, in some people's fantasies, it was already there. I mean, I want to mention here the writings of someone named Yosef Shechman, who was toying with the idea of exchanging Iraqi Jews for Palestinians. Yes. Of course, he didn't ask neither group if they were really willing to participate in this exchange, but that was the, the case. All of this also build, go, builds on the myth that the 1923-24 exchange between Turkey and, and Greece, yes, was uh, done by way of agreement of the people who were actually were displaced between Smyrna and Saloniki, for instance, that, that was there. Now, the fact of the matter is, is that if you have close to one million Jews, or a little over 800,000 Jews in the entire Middle East around 1948. Fact of the matter is that today you have a very small community in Iran. You have maybe one Jew in, um, in Iraq, and you have about 3,000 Jews in, um, in, um, in Morocco and smaller, uh, similar numbers in Egypt, maybe less than that, um, and in, in Tunisia and so on. In fact, in Egypt, you have only women right now in the Jewish community. Okay? So they disappeared. They left. Now, what do we, do, we, do we make of this story? I think that the government of Israel today is kind of reluctantly, but they want to move that and push that as a story of a, um, uh, a case of refugees. Okay? This contradicts the general Zionist narrative that basically holds that every Jew who comes to Israel comes out of s s uh, genuine Zionist sentiment, whether they're refugees or not. Okay? And not something that, and not against their will. If you're a refugee, you move to this place against your will. Okay, that's the fact. And they, they, they were trying very hard to play this game. But I can tell you that, for instance, in 1953, people came to my grandfather, you know, and asked him to write what kind of property he had um, in Iraq, and you know, maybe he wants it back, you know, in order to make a kind of a claim. This was already an attempt of Moshe Sharet, then who was then the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to raise that is a kind of a counter suit to Palestinian claims uh, uh, to return. Now, this was, this was in the early 50s when the Palestinian refugee uh, question was still on people's minds. But we should remember that after that, it kind of disappeared. People forgot about the Palestinian refugee question. Now, in the past uh, 20 years, it's coming back. People, the world remembers that there are Palestinian refugees, and the world wants to do something with them. And in this context, the so-called Jewish Nakba Yes, it's coming back. I, you can say that there was a mass exodus because it was gradual. It took over 40 years for the Middle East to be emptied of its Jews. Okay? 
I mean, in the 70s, you still see Jewish communities, not big, but they kept getting dwindling and dwindling and so on. I mean, Jews in the Arab world were in conflict with Arabs over the question of the rise of Israel and Zionism, and this was something that was forced on them. Okay? Arab nationalism was putting the question of Palestine in the center, and the people who were seen responsible for it in Baghdad were the Baghdadi Jews. In Cairo were the Cairan Jews. The tragedy is because people did not make these choices. When you read their writings, when you read the writings of Jewish senators in Iraq in the, in the 20s and in the 40s, you see reluctance at best. Sometimes you see even much more harsh reactions to, to Zionism. They simply didn't want that. Okay? It was undermining their status, and they could not imagine themselves leaving. This is where the tragedy lies.